So let me tell you a little bit about my study. The title, International Female Student Athletes at American Universities. Uh, reasons to attend and experiences that followed. So the, the participants that I was speaking with, um, they are, were all females and they were all student athletes from a variety of institutions, which I shall um, share with you. The why, this is for Dr. Ree. Why? Why should we investigate the experience of international student athletes? This is the slide that didn't want to open, so we're going to see what happens here. The why is because the numbers are ever increasing. This is Division I programs. This is 2010 and 2017. Um, while ice hockey has only increased 4%, field hockey has increased 140%. They've gone from 42 athletes to 101 athletes at the Division I level. So if you check out all of the women's uh, sports, the numbers have increased anywhere from that 4% to 140%. For the Division II sports, the same trend is happening, uh, where we've got uh, swimming increasing from 16 athletes in 2010 to 67 athletes, at over 300% increase. So the reason, one of the reasons, why investigating the experience um, and the adjustment of these women to their athletic teams at the universities is because they're increasing. There's more and more students attending, um, and retention is important. Their satisfaction is important, their well-being is important. Um, so we need to take a look at it. And the problem is, this isn't a very exciting slide, it's just a slide. The problem is, there's not a whole lot of research about it. Um, I will dive back a couple of steps and we'll talk about the proposal that I did last year and tell you a little bit about the literature, but there's not a whole lot of it out there. And so that was the other reason which uh, inspired me, I would say. And then last but not least, I have a personal interest. Way back in the day, coaching student athletes. And then now in the classroom. I have a fair number of student athletes in many of my classes. And so it is in, important to me to understand what their experience is and to kind of investigate um, how we can all uh, improve that experience for them. All right, so let's take a look at the literature. This is a, a recap from last year, so I won't spend a ton of time on it. So some studies have been done to just sort of assess the increase in enrollment. And I already showed you the table, so you can see those numbers themselves. Um, but higher education, um, IES stands for international students, okay? And if I say ISA, then that's student athletes specifically. But international, uh, student enrollment is just up in general. I do believe, I have looked at some numbers and it has taken a dip in the last two years, uh, as we may have imagined for political reasons. Um, nonetheless, in general, the trend has been up and there are more international students that are attending universities. Um, in general, because it's perceived that there are better opportunities. And I highlighted that word, or I turned it green because that is a word you will hear a lot. Um, when I start talking specifically about the student athlete population. So there's a perceived value um, with the degree, there's better opportunities, um, and some hope to remain in the country perhaps. ISA, that's the student athletes themselves, their motive, sorry. Motives for international student athletes, um, prestige for the degree, employment options perhaps after they finish that degree. Um, one that I heard regularly was superior facilities and advances in the training and the competition. Um, I would say that's something that uh, the work that I've done has definitely reinforced. Um, and opportunities to experience American culture. Um, I think I heard a little bit of all of those and I will share that with you as well. So again, part of the goal of doing research obviously is to see if we can support what's been done and then try to fill the gaps. Uh, institutions themselves are pursuing international students and uh, college athletic programs are pursuing international student athletes. Um, on the student athlete side, um, a lot of it has to do with just trying to pursue talent, all right? And also just to bring that diversity into the programs and make them more um, 
just more global and, and improve the experience for the athletes. And a lot of the international student athletes bring with them some pretty strong academic background. So it enhances the uh, academic merits of the program as well. Things that we know. Okay, challenges. This is a pretty shallow area of research so far. And this is one of the things that I dug into pretty pretty vigorously. Um, for international students, um, mental health, emotional adjustment, language proficiency, cultural changes, and social networks. Um, I, I can imagine that those, are, those would come to our mind if we were going to brainstorm that those are things that international students in general have to, uh, those are challenges that they face. First year international student athletes, um, this study was done and uh, the attempt was made to compare um, first year international student athletes with first year international students um, in just that transition. Um, and it turned out that the, the information, the, it kind of conflicted. It didn't seem like it was accurate information. Um, and that could have had to do with the number of participants that were involved in the study. Uh, but that, that posed a question in my mind, and that's, that was part of what drove this study this year is when I saw those findings last year, it just didn't seem to, um, just didn't seem real um, credible to me, so I wanted to look at it further. And then again, we've got another set of studies that uh, were kind of in a direct uh, contradictions with each other. Um, looking, and they were both quantitative studies, and as I will explain, the work that I've been doing has been qualitative. So quantitative is the, you know, survey-based um, paper and pencil type Likert scale, if you will. Um, and so the um, Ridinger and Pasteur, they have been doing research with student athletes um, probably for about the last 15 or 16 years. But again, it's been pretty sparse and kind of far and few between, if you will. So um, they said uh, international student athletes statistically were the most adjusted of all, okay? And then another study was done and found international student athletes to be less adjusted than just your typical um, international student. So there, there's just a lot of confusion there. So um, in both cases, both, uh, both research parties said that they felt that further research needed to be done. So again, I'm just kind of justifying why I wanted to take the leap and look at this. Last, last year at this time, it took me 30 minutes to tell you that. I just whipped through it. Awesome. Okay, so uh, what we decided to do what I decided to do was build off of this framework, okay, that had been started. And um, the, the three pieces of it are the antecedents, the things that are um, happening to the student athletes and impacting them as they're making that decision and choosing to come to the states, um, the adjustment elements, and then what are the outcomes. So most of the research that has been done has been over here. And um, my little red lines, which I know that you probably can't read, but the second wave of studies um, that were done, um, they started adding things and taking things away and whatnot. So in, in general, there's a personal category an interpersonal category, cultural, and then perceptual. So these kind of things that influence the student's choice to um, come to the states. And then once the students got here, um, what kind of an adjustment? What were the things that they had adjustment? What were the little pockets that we should investigate? Academic, social, athletic, personal, emotional, and then institutional attachment. Um, I haven't found anybody that's done anything on that. I haven't found any research. And so as I uh, created the questions that I was going to ask, I sort of focused a little bit here. And I also did branch out a little bit to the outcomes, the satisfaction, and the performance. So that is the, uh, the model that I was looking at, if you will. So that's the literature. Let's take a look at the methodology. What did I do? As I said, it was uh, qualitative in nature, all right? And I set up some in-depth interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews, had some leading questions that I threw out to them, and I, I uh, conducted it in small groups. And as I would say, there was a little variety in the groups size, and I will explain that, but it was purposeful, okay? I wanted international female undergraduates, okay? Um, I ended up with 22 participants. Uh, they represented 16 countries. I've got a list on the next slide because Corey wanted it. Um, I've got five public uh, Division I institutions represented, four conferences, and nine different sponsored sports. So I feel like I got kind of a good breadth of, um, of participants. Mm, did I do that one? 
Oh, you know what? Let me go back because I think this is because I wasn't a savvy. Okay, hold on. Countries, there it is. There you go. 16 of them. Belgium, British Columbia, Bulgaria, Czech, France, Germany, Great Britain, Greece, Hungary, Iceland, New Zealand, Portugal, Serbia, Slovenia, Taiwan, and Ukraine. I contacted them um, via email, just campus email, after I had um, gotten approval either from the sen senior women's administrator at the given institution or from the team coach themselves. Um, let them know what I was doing. They said it was okay. And then I just scoured the rosters and um, searched for their emails and reached out to them and asked if they would like to participate. <coughs> Before I met with them, I asked them to fill out a Qualtrics survey so that I could just sort of assess and make sure what I knew what their background was a little bit. So I asked um, their uh, date of birth, um, how many years they'd been at that current institution. Um, I believe I asked if they had transferred as well because I wanted to know how long they'd been in the States, number of years that they'd lived in the States, country of residence, um, and also country of their secondary education. Um, maybe not as common with women, but I know with men sometimes they'll come to the States and go to an academy and then uh, enroll in a uh, university after that. Um, I asked them to self-identify their comfort level with uh, verbal English communication. And also I think maybe just if they were comfortable with the group setting and asking, having me ask them questions, just again to sort of assess whether they were comfortable. And then I asked them to identify their sport. Our video recorded or audio recorded, our exchange. Um, I think the shortest one was probably about 45 minutes and the longest one was probably about 100 minutes. And that was, I, had a, I had a chatty pair one day. Um, so um, I did the transcription of the interviews. Um, I removed all the identifiers except for the name of the sport, the country, and what year they were in school. And um, am in the process of passing them off to the co-investigator so that they can code them. So um, on my title slide, I missed it, but on my title slide, I did say that it's a work in progress. And that is because um, I've looked at a lot of the, um, I've, I know all of the transcription, I took part in the interviews, um, but my co-investigators um, only have about half of them, okay? So um, we hope to get uh, this wrapped up, hopefully, in the next, in the next month or so. Um, Limitations, I'm not really sure. You can, you can tell me what the limitations are when we wrap up. Um, the interview groups, they varied from one to three person. I was hoping, one to three people. I was hoping maybe to have four to six. Juggling student athlete schedule is kind of a challenge. So um, sometimes they would say that they were coming and then they didn't come or whatever. Um, I did a few one-on-ones and I did a few groups of three and I did lots of pairs and anyway. Um, some of the interviews were conducted face-to-face -face and, I, and I video recorded those. And then some of them were FaceTime um, when I did some students that were in the Midwest. All right, so what comes now is comments. Not necessarily themes quite yet, but I categorize them into what are the reasons? Like why did they choose to come to the institution? So I've got some quotes here, and I know there's a lot of words, so I'll just try to read it, and hopefully you can digest it rather than have to look at everything. So the, one of the things I heard from virtually every, all 22, was the decision to come here was based on coming for the sport. Education was secondary. It, it was there, for some it was more meaningful than others, um, but sport was definitely the reason that these women came to the, their chosen institution. I wanted to study and play sport. In my country, it is not possible. When you finish high school, you have to choose either sport, a job, or university. I didn't want to choose. I wanted to do both, and that is why I came to America. Another student said, I wanted to go to the States and play because you're going to feel like a professional player. The dream is always to go pro, but instead of actually getting paid, you get paid by getting an education, which is pretty cool. It's a very American concept, varsity sports. It's an American thing. I either had to decide to play sports, which is what I was going to do, 
But then at the same time, I was like, mm, the quality here, US of practices and coaching abilities, they're higher. I thought I could try to do both at the same time. And following that, I could get a, a good sport experience um, that will help me when I go pro and at the same time get a degree. Opportunity. This was uh, probably the second I kept hearing this word over and over and over again. Um, it's a great opportunity, especially if you plan to play your sport for four more years. Also, you learn about something different in the world. It's not all about Belgium or Germany or Czech. These days, it's so global. If you have the chance, I say go for it. There will be times when you'll say things are better at home, but I feel like everybody says that at some point, especially knowing I want to turn pro after college. There is no way I would have done anything different. I have four more years of practice and coaching in America. The American dream. Lots of dreamers out there. Lots of ties to the media. I was always watching movies about America and how it's a perfect life here and how it's all dreams come true here. And you have this stereotype, if you really want something, you go for this dream and you never give up. I feel so grateful for this place because we have a lot of opportunity here and coaches and all the people trying to help you. Another student said, I had this picture of the US from the media and the movies and it was, it was just a big thing. When I was traveling for the championships, we were like, oh, they're from the US. And she just got all wide-eyed and made this big expression with her hands. We were on the same bus with them. Like, we all learn English, English, and it's never perfect. And then suddenly we talk to a real person, and then I realized this is real. It's not just the movies. This is really happening. I heard from someone something about an opportunity. The decision more uh, the decision more the recruiting the decision was more the recruiting process and people I had made connections with. I wasn't really interested in playing in the U.S. I played with all these people back home and they've been here. They've been to college and they told me it was a good way to improve both ways. Another student. There was this guy. I heard a lot of that. There was this guy. There was this guy who works in an administrative role for my club and he had a lot of experience helping people from her country, find schools, and telling him what to do to get the visa. And there are several Americans on my club team, and they would try to sell us on going to America to play. Uh, I checked the roster and whatever. There was an international player on the roster from a nearby country, and she speaks Serbian really well. So I reached out to her on some social media stuff, and I knew if I came here, I would have, I would have her as a backup. So whatever I need, Whatever I don't know, I could ask. If I didn't understand something at practice, she could translate. And she went through all this stuff before, so she would be able to help, and it was easier. There's definitely a community among the um, international student athletes where they lean on each other and help each other out. Uh, we decided to come here together. That also helped because it's good when you have someone. You don't just get thrown into the fire by yourself. There were a couple of um, different athletes that I spoke to at different schools that had um, joined, had come to a school with someone else. Uh, challenges. The process. The process of making the decision to come to the States, this is a really big deal for many international students. Um, there's, a, there's a very different world in some countries than it is in this country. Um, Lack of knowledge. Very few of the student athletes that I visited with had visited a campus. A few of them had. Many of them had no clue where they were going. They just had a conversation. I didn't even know, like, what, what is Division I and what is Division II? I didn't know what is good tennis at a school and what is not. So I was like, oh, Florida, that sounds cool. Oh, California, that would be nice. I had no idea and another student. I looked at some golf rankings just to know how the golf team was, and I looked at the school website just to have an idea. I had no idea what it was like here. I was like, oh well, we'll see. So there, there's a little bit of adventurous, adventuresome in them, um, and just give it a shot. The TOEFL and the SAT. Um, as you know, students have to t international students have to test um, to attend a U.S. institution. We need to pass the SAT and the TOEFL in order to come here. And my friend, 
got a friend, who already came to the States, she knew a professor in my country that knew how to prepare for the exams because she's American. I went to her and I prepared for two months in order to pass the exam. I studied all day, every day just to pass it. And then I came here and with classes, I would go to class, but I didn't really understand what was going on. I worked my way through it, but I really didn't understand what was going on. So um, the, the TOEFL and the SAT, this is a big deal. Some of these, some of these young women literally started with the ABCs. And they studied for months, starting with the ABCs to be able to um, speak. Um, others had English in their classes. Um, and, and that was a little bit, um, uh, I don't want to say deceiving to them, but they thought, oh, I've had it in class, it's okay. And then they had to do more with it and it was a bit of a challenge. So a lot of them um, sacrificed a fair amount, spent a lot of time, spent a lot of money trying to prepare for the exam so that they could pass. Fear of the language. I was really afraid of the language barriers, like not getting it all together in class, not being on top of it, not knowing how exams work. Somebody else said the most difficult challenge, the language of course, but all the people here, including my team and professors, they're all very kind. But that is the, the most thing I worry about, was the language. Uh, the first three months were terrible. I didn't understand anything on the court. I didn't understand anything in the classroom. I had another student athlete help me a lot. She kind of speaks my language and, and she can understand my accent. Um, the time frame for comfort and comprehension, I would say ranged from three months to six months. And after six months, it was like a light clicked on. And, and for most of them, they were just, uh, it was just relief after six months. They were much more comfortable. The language was no longer a barrier. Um, lonely versus homesick. Um, this didn't really come up a whole lot. Lonely wasn't really a word that was discussed a whole lot. Um, one student um, who was from Taiwan, um, I, I had a hard time with the interview with her because she was really sad because she did, she felt she struggled with the language and her language was actually pretty good. I, I don't think that it was a language thing. I think she, she even said she was a little bit shy, a little bit introverted, but she wanted so badly to make friends and connect with people. Um, and she just, she just couldn't do it. And she just kept saying, well, it's because my language is bad. It's become, because my language is bad. And I, I, don't, I don't think that that was really the issue. Um, and there's some other um, transcriptions which I haven't shared. I'm, I'm only sharing uh, quotes and information from the ones that, that my... Uh, my co-investigators have because I don't want to, they, they've already seen this, um, so I don't want to show them stuff that I haven't already, that they haven't seen yet, so. Um, and then a few mentioned being homesick. Um, those that did said that it was a short-lived thing, like maybe when they first got here, um, and then they kind of got over it. And then the only time anybody really expressed it, some of them said when they went home for Christmas or when they went home for the summer, um, when they got on the plane to come back, they, there were a few tears for, from some of them when they came back. Um, but as soon as they landed in the States, they, it, it was like they felt like they were home and they were back in their routine. So um, this wasn't really an issue um, for, for any of the women that I spoke to. Daily necessities. Um, doing stuff you don't think about, like getting set up with a bank account or getting a phone number. I didn't have a phone for two weeks and nobody thought about the fact that I might need one. Um, and there were a lot of issues with my visa. So there was one woman in particular who had a lot of issues with her visa and um, with the date that had been put on it and that surfaces here in a little bit. Transportation, not something I really thought about and maybe just because of the town that we live in, um, but that was a common theme for student athletes that are not in the, on this campus. Um, here, everybody has a car and people were driving to class and practice all the time and I just always had to get a ride and go grocery shopping and stuff like that. So I could never do what I, want, what I wanted when I wanted to. I had to ask people when they were doing that. And another student athlete said, and they all had cars. I didn't have a car my first year. That was hard, not knowing how to get around. When I would be able to go to this place or that place, um, in town, it is pretty hard to get around if you don't have a car. And I didn't want to always rely on the same people to get a ride. So. One of my questions was something like, um, at what point did you feel like relief? You know, was there a time when you just sort of felt like relaxed a little bit? Um, and it was often associated with the language, getting over the hump on the language, or it was getting a car because they really felt stressed about having to <coughs> uh, rely on their peers to get them places. It made them feel awkward. Um, so 
not, again, not something that I had really considered personally. And our last one. Culture. The word culture got thrown around a lot. And I always had to say, tell me what you mean by that. Okay, so food was a, was a common one. Um, I miss food so much. My God, I gained so much because I was eating everything. Some things I just never tried, so I ate everything. I never had oatmeal or pancakes. We don't have peanut butter. I would take this and this and this and this. Um, and in the end, I wouldn't be satisfied, satisfied because I did not like most of what I had eaten. <laughs> This is a big one. Along with saying the reason that they came to the United States was because they wanted to improve their athletic abilities. Um, greetings. When people say, how you doing? Yeah, so we just don't do that. And if we did, we would actually be curious what the other person had to say. And here, it is just not really like that. Sometimes I try to answer, and sometimes I didn't. Some people don't even respond or ask you back. It's the weirdest thing, and I don't like it. And if it took me a long time to get used to it, Literally every person you pass asks you this question. Um, and I just started laughing because literally every person said this at some point. And I just, as soon as they said it, I'd smile and they said, have you heard this before? And I'm like, yes, from everybody. And some people were really offended by it. Um, like, it, yeah, they really had an issue with the fact that people would not pause and have a conversation. And then other people just kind of dismissed it as, you know, that, you know, cultural one-off. But anyway, so that's kind of a, an interesting one. All right, reflections. Those were challenges, right? Reflections. You come here and you're like, wow, I never got that type of feeling being at home. Nothing is wow. You come here and there is everything. They have facilities, they have people to take care of you. I was just impressed with everything. I was really excited. I really liked everything. We were driving and I saw the mascot and the school signs and it was so cool. It was like a movie. When I came, I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. I have never seen this before. So for me, it was so many new things. And also the culture was different. People were so much nicer than back home. So I have to say that this is a really good experience for me. To summarize the whole thing, there are cultural differences, there are struggles, and things you need to do to get used to, but what you get out of it, and she was emphatically tapping the table, is completely a different thing. You're going to be an independent person. You get a degree, and you get to develop in sport, too. It is a very big opportunity, and you have the opportunity to be an international student athlete in America. Do it. The academic transition. Uh, <laughs> in school in the U.S. is a lot easier homework, classes, everything. The lectures are spoon-fed to you, and then you as an athlete, you have tutoring, and freshmen have eight hours of mandatory tutoring. Your hand is held through your whole freshman year, so it is definitely different. And, and another student from another school said, we were at a SAC meeting once, and a woman from Taiwan said, school here is a joke. And then an Indian woman from the tennis team agreed, and then we all agreed. At home, it is way harder, way more time consuming. We spend so much more time in class, so much more time on homework. But I guess that's kind of the beauty of it. I guess, less school, more athletics. <clears throat> I feel like classes. I don't want to say easier, but in my country, we have a lot of tests. If you don't get a high score on the test, you don't pass the class. But here, there are many chances. You get points for attendance and homework and quizzes, so I won't feel very nervous about the final. At home, the final is the biggest thing, sometimes the only thing in the semester. So if you have done all your homework and attended school, but you didn't test well that day, you don't get anything. There is more pressure to study in my country. I kind of like this better. Uh, in my country, if you go to college, you have one final at the end of the semester, and it counts for 100%. So you're on your own for three months. Here in the U.S., it turned out to be good because if I play and practice, I have all those other things, quizzes, exams, finals, and at the end of the year, the final doesn't count 100%. You can kind of work around it. <laughs> Friends, athletes, they're a tight-knit group. 
I was living with two of my teammates, and one was a field hockey player. At this school, most athletes hang out together. Of course, people are closest with members of their own teams, but the athlete community is kind of strong. So I knew all the athletes that lived on my floor. Then we always hang out because we're always locked in the same building with tutoring, and we always eat our meals together. Of course, in class I had a couple of non-athlete friends, but most definitely, definitely mostly athletes. We have this little international community of student athletes. I know internationals from Australia, the Netherlands, and I think it's super cool to have those people because they know exactly what we are all going through. Sorry, come on. There's one more. And again, the media, I knew what to expect. It's not like Bangladesh where you don't know what you're getting yourself into. It's a lot like you see in the movies. And for the most part, it's true. You have frat houses and tailgates and football games and stuff like that. Recommendations. For other international student athletes from their peers. <coughs> Study for the TOEFL and the SAT early. Visit the schools if you can. The coach oftentimes travels to see the athletes, and a lot of times the athletes don't go to the school. Um, research the school and the team's record. Look at the stats of those currently on the team and investigate more than one school. Um, I wouldn't say there was dissatisfaction from very many of the um, women that I spoke to, only one really in particular. Um, and others just are a little bit regretful or remorseful that they didn't investigate further. Like, I was competing against this person and now that person's at Ohio State and they're kicking my butt and I'm at this other school but I used to beat her so how come I didn't think about going to Ohio State and I went to this other school instead. So there was this thing where sometimes they felt like they, they wished that they would have looked further but they kind of jumped on the first offer that came their way. Learn about the coach. Find a coach that you really like because you will be staying there for four years so if you cannot trust the coach or if the coach does not like you, you will feel very tired. Uh, the coach is very important when searching for a school. And surprisingly, um, I think only two or three students uh, mentioned that as one of the things that they investigated. For the most part, they were looking for a scholarship, definitely. Um, and then the second criteria was, I don't know, there was just a lot of unknowns. I mean, very few of these student athletes even seem to know how to research, like what is the NCAA or what are the rankings. Um, a few of them went through, um, uh, you know, a guy that they knew, that knew somebody, that knew somebody, one of those that helped them with some things. But a lot of them just did it independently. Um, and as, as such, um, they, they may not have made the decision that they could have made, but they were all really um, pleased with the opportunity. So, um, Take notes in English. Sometimes even when I don't understand a word, I put it down because I don't know if it applies to every single school. Um, and for international students, but my tests are very often multiple choice, almost every single one of them. So sometimes, even if I don't understand, I remember the word, and back home it's not like that. Um, take notes in English and look up words you don't understand. It makes the adjustment process quicker if you try to utilize English as much as you can. Um, I'd say about three quarters of the people I spoke to, I did ask them that question. Like, do, when you take notes in class, do you take it in your language? What, what are you hearing? And um, those that... Uh, acclimated faster with the language seemed to be those that took, took the notes in English um, and to go home and translate it if they had taken it in French or in Serbian or, or whatever, they had to go home and translate it and then look up words and it just ended up taking you know twice as long. So uh, particularly that first semester, there's a lot of hours spent um, trying to wrap their brain around the academic piece of it. Um, they all sounded very diligent, um, and then it's just like over, over the hump at the six-month mark between the language and, um, and being able to um, just kind of acclimate to what's going on in the classroom. <coughs> Um, when you get your I-90, I heard a couple things, I-90, I-2s, different forms, there's a date on it. My school, uh, the school had a set date that they were starting, okay, and it was September when the school was going to start. So. <coughs> On this woman's form, when the school filled it out, they put September whatever for the start date. Well, it turns out she was a soccer player, and 
the season started, or she had to be back on campus in July. So she got in trouble at the border every time she tried to get into the country because the school inevitably put the wrong date on it every single time, and it didn't matter who she spoke to. So the paperwork was really a grind, and she was getting rerouted to Canada, and it was a big hassle for her, and she was very frustrated by it. There should be a specific person that can take care of the role of advisor for international student athletes. Sometimes if I ask someone for help, they refer me to the international programs office. And when I spoke to them, they referred me back to the athletic department. Um, and two students in particular had a lot of issues with taxes, and they were just getting, um, getting the runaround. So between the, the paperwork for the visa and the taxes, there were some um, concerns about that. Um, for the administration, um, we had tutors for English, but they didn't really have a clue how to explain stuff to international students. Uh, we might know talking the language, but going to school and doing the technical writing, that is very different, and we don't know how to use our words. Um, another student said it would be helpful to have an English section with vocabulary and grammar for international students. Um, I was talking with another international student last night, and we said that we are missing something. No one is going to uh, teach us um, what we need to do for a paper. So the writing piece of it is a, is a challenge. So winding back to this, like I said, I'm not, I'm not going to dig in too far to all of the, the discussions of what I found and where I'm going because this is a work in progress. Um, the the um, quotes that I've pulled, I tried to pull like two or three for each one. Um, there were, those were things that I heard a lot and I just tried to grab the most kind of articulate, thoughtful ones. Um, but I did kind of find it interesting that, um, like, language isn't really an issue here, but it's like the number one issue that people always spoke about. Um, the thing, the motivating thing, um, I don't see scholarship on there. Um, I see some other things, um, and I think that as we kind of as we kind of dig into more of the transcriptions. Um, th some of these things I think are reality, but I also think some of them don't really exist in the decision-making process. So I think, um, I, like I said, I've tried to give you just kind of a little umbrella of what it looks like, but um, this adjustment piece, you know, with the academics, I think that um, there can be some um, discussion and maybe some implications to help the student athlete on the academic side. Um, the athletic, I didn't pull any quotes on that. There are some, um, there, there were some opinions and some thoughts about um, adjusting to the training and adjusting to the sport. Most of them really felt comfortable adjusting to the sport, uh, but some of them, the conditioning was very different. Uh, the amount of time spent was very different. Um, and again, there was sometimes a lot of confusion the first two months or so of practice, um, just kind of going with the flow and not necessarily knowing what was happening because of the language barrier. Um, as far as outcomes, the uh, satisfaction and the gratefulness and the opportunity, um, I, I don't know, I can't tell you how many times I heard those words. Um, the, the women were just really pleased to be here going to school and training. And even though uh, what brought them here was their sport, and I do think that that was what was driving most of them, um, they all seem to be pretty invested in the academic side as well. So I think as far as moving forward, maybe trying to investigate some of this and some of the connections between, um, that's kind of what I envision going forward, trying to close this out a little bit. Uh, future studies, I don't know about um, expanding um, to include just international students to see what kind of comparison, you know, there's a, a big push on campuses with the INTO program. There's a lot of international students um, coming to campuses, so um, maybe even try to gather um, students that are from the same countries that um, I had originally um, spoken with and just to see what their experience is, how the experience is different. I s think that I could imagine some comparisons just because there is a team dynamic um, and that leaning on their, on their um, peers. Um, but to what extent does that happen just with a general international student? And <clears throat> if it doesn't, then perhaps it should. Um, and I, you know, I don't know about uh, incorporating men, shifting the line of qu existing questioning, um, and taking it a, a different direction. I think I missed one slide, so I'm going to go back. Um, and then, yeah, for personal direction, um, I submitted an abstract for a poster at the showcase. I submitted an abstract for the College Sport Research Institute. Um, 
they have a conference at the beginning of April, I believe. Um, and then there's a number of journals that um, examine uh, student athletes and their experience. Um, and international students as well. So that's kind of where I'm headed. There's a lot of unknowns, but I think um, there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity to take what I've got and go one way or another, I think. Questions, comments? <clears throat> I won't close it in case somebody wants to see something. Yeah? First, I'd like to say that every coach who <coughs> recruits internationally Men or women should see a presentation like this. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> secondly, I'd like to ask: uh, Was there <coughs> was there anything that stood out to you as a surprise in your uh, in your investigation? Um, <coughs> I think just some of those things we forget about the everyday things. Like I, I don't think I really would have thought about transportation as being something that weighs on a Grocery student's shopping. mind. Grocery shopping. Um, and things like that again but it's because of where we are and you know we have students have access to the bus if they really want it and um, one of the women said I said well I you know I want to know if she was just being kind of lazy I said well if you could walk to the store like how long would it take you to walk to the store she said oh 45 minutes and she said I do bike sometimes but not in the winter because she was in the <coughs> Midwest and so um, so transportation was something I didn't think about and the fact that um, yeah that kind of gets tiresome if you feel like you've got to rely on somebody all the time even to get to practice if the pr you know if the if the pitch is off off campus or something like that um, and then um, yeah some of the paperwork things and the um, <coughs> you know getting a phone and you know some of those things you're like well you're an adult should you be taking care of these things on your own but you know they're landing in a country that they don't know about and um, they don't know how to resolve some of those issues and um, there is a language barrier so maybe they're not quite sure who to ask and how to ask the question so they just kind of suck it up and deal with it until I don't know they get brave enough to ask the question so <clears throat> I think there's certain things that a <clears throat> a coach or a staff or a you know a week of welcome kind of thing um, that could help um, get some of those students um, acclimated a little bit yeah yeah uh, <coughs> sorry if you mentioned this already um what were the <coughs> what were the ages of the they were all pretty much traditionally i i did group them into <coughs> sorry, let me, let me ask the question. Like okay what, at what stage in their career Right. I grouped them into um, English speaking and non-English speaking when I interviewed them. So I, I made sure that if I had a couple of people that they both spoke English or either that or they were from a non-English speaking country. And then I grouped them into freshman, sophomore, and I grouped them into junior, senior. Um, and so I do think that that's something I could include on the slide is the, you know, their age, you know, what year they are in school. And um, <coughs> definitely the, uh, there was one, um, there was one group where I had like a sophomore and a senior, but otherwise, and it was funny because the senior was like, oh yeah, I remember that, you know, and, but so they, there's definitely patterns to their growth and development and dealing with those things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you pull the slide up that has the countries of the people that you spoke with? Because I'm, I'm wondering about the socioeconomic uh, yes. Demographics compared to what is at most um, D1 or D3 American institutions. Mm. Yeah, one, one story, one of the women um, did an internship in uh, Chicago last summer and made the comment, um, and she trained, she found a place to train and she did this internship and it was, I think she might be a hospitality major or a business major of some kind. So she went to Chicago and I think it was about eight weeks and she worked eight hours a day, she got $17 an hour and it was six or eight weeks and she said she made more money in that time than her parents make in a year. Yeah. I just wonder because there really are no, <coughs> what we would consider third world countries on this there, there are poor people in every country, so sure. that's not really, and, and there are poor people at every university, too, with um, financial aid and Pell Grants and things, so mm -hmm. for uh, the American students. But I just wondered if the transition was different from 
possibly the haves to the never haves. Yeah. I think it might be tied to sport too, the same way it is in this country. You know, there were some um, certain athletes, you know, tennis players, golfers, whatever, that um, may mention maybe their parents might try to come and watch them at an event or if they stayed in the summer and went on a tour or something like that. <coughs> And then there were others, some of the sports that the students were not going to go professional in, be that rowing or something like that, then um, it seemed to be more working class, perhaps. I'm, I'm generalizing there for sure, but yeah. Question. Yeah. I mean, on that, that aspect <coughs> of going pro, did you have any sense, because so a number of them mentioned yeah. that, um, did you have any sense of the likelihood that yeah, you know, I guess that probably would have been the other shocker was so many people said that, um, that that was really what their motive was, was to get, well, the fact that they had to choose, that when they come out of high school, they either have to continue with school, which means they're giving up their sport, or they have to go pro, and most of them are not at the level that they could make it, either age-wise or competitive-wise or whatever. And so... Um, so they say, well, I, I was going to go to school anyway, so I'm going to go to school and keep doing my sport and with the hope of continuing to develop my skill set and go pro. Yeah. But I was, I was kind of surprised because obviously that, that tends to be something that you hear a lot of male athletes say, but it's becoming more common for women athletes. And I, I mean, I can see that even in our, own, in our own campus, you know, in our own student athletes that some come in and that's what their aspiration is, whereas I think... 20 years ago, I don't think that that was the thing as much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you considered <coughs> kind of taking the themes that you gathered from this information to make more of a quantitative survey to reach a larger audience, or do you kind of want to stay more with this interview format? Good question. I, um, I was concerned about the language barrier mm -hmm. being an issue, um, and so that's why I didn't jump quantitative the first time because yeah. I just wanted to make sure I could have a conversation and make sure that they could understand. Um, and then the literature review indicated that all of the studies had been quantitative and the recommendations from those studies had been somebody needs to do a qualitative because this is, and, and the, the numbers were always wonky in those. Like there was always, if they were looking at domestic students and international students, it would be like they would have whatever, 400 domestic and 20 international and they would try to like make some kind of sense out of that and yeah, anyway and it seems like a lot of your assumptions like you said like you didn't think about transportation mm -hmm. you have this information you could craft questions based on right what those were yeah 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 so anyway that's that was my rationale was because i did think about it um it's easier to to just kick out a survey yeah. um but i have to say this was really fulfilling like i loved talking to these women um different stories different um, yeah, it, I mean, I learned a lot, and it was just really kind of inspiring to hear them. Yeah. Yes. Can you share one or two of the uh, more humorous uh, stories <laughs> you heard from, your, from these athletes? Well, the humorous ones usually revolved around that, how are you, or what's going on, or, you know, that in passing, because that really had some people riled up, and they would, they would re reenact whatever, and they would just be like, why, why are you not talking, why are you still walking, you know, you, you just asked me a question, it is a question, right, you know, and so a lot of it had to do with that, um, and the food, you know, different comments about, um, there was a lot of laughter, sometimes food brought out a lot of laughter, if somebody said, wow, the food in the U.S. really sucks, then whoever was sitting th with them would start laughing, and, um, and then, uh, well, personal story, because when um, Matea and Simon first came here, um, I had taken them over to a, a store in the mall, and I think it was Duran Lowe's, and we were looking, helping them find a bed or something. And, uh, and then I said, well, okay, well, let's go over to Walmart, where we had parked the car at Duran Lowe's. And so they start taking off across the street, and like, I'm headed to the car. I'm going to drive the car across the street to Walmart. And Matea just looked at me like, what are you doing? You are not driving the car. And I had two stories like that. Like, Americans, they drive their car everywhere. I mean, seriously, you go to Winco, and then they drive it to Rite Aid. And it was kind of funny because I was like, <laughs> <laughs> guilty, guilty as charged. Yeah, anyway, so that was a little bit entertaining too. But yeah, but you know, most <laughs> college kids from America think that food in college sucks. So yes. Like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Probably true. 
And I don't, yeah. I mean, some, I wasn't necessarily talking to just our athletes because I was thinking none of our athletes should be complaining about, complaining about food. But um, I did hear that from, and I think it was just, a, again, that going back to that culture thing, like bread, they don't know how to make bread or, you know, whatever. Anyway, yeah. So it was a uh, semi-structured interview. Yeah. And uh, how many quest semi-structured questions do you have and do you remember what, what they were? I don't like yeah, they were... Um, I did skip the slide. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, let me go. Let's go back to. Uh, why did they choose to attend? Um, what factors influenced their decision? Challenges faced and adjustment to life as an international student athlete. Uh, outcomes from the experience and recommendations for future students. And obviously, sometimes you go off on a tangent and have to bring yourself back. Yeah. Um, as you were sort of doing the semi-structured interview, um, did you ever find yourself like having to make a note to ask oh, yeah. about the same questions in order to keep it sort of consistent? Uh, because I think when you're doing, or issues that I've come up with with sort of semi-structure or just having sort of a baseline is, as one group starts going, you think, wow, that's a really good point. Yeah. If you haven't asked other groups and you feel like, I don't feel like that's a I think I saturated that with it. You know? And so did you face that or did you change your, your sort of your interview structure changes you went through? I, I tried not to. I tried to sort of have this be the thing, but I also, um, my harder problem was if there were two people talking and someone went off on a tangent but happened to say, oh, well, culture, something, something, and then they started, I had to like write down culture because one, I wanted to come back to it to see what they meant, but two, I still wanted the other person to have an opportunity to build on what they had just talked about that may not have been culture. And so it, I had a, I wouldn't say a more difficult time, but I was kind of managing the conversation to make sure, I almost like just talking to one person more than two or three, because particularly in one interview where there were three people, I could tell distinctly that one person did not agree with what the other person was saying. And, and she was really n not having it because the other person was, was dissatisfied with something. And person number three did not agree and was uh, getting a little defensive about it. And she held her tongue and she held her tongue. And then finally when she spoke, everybody had to shut up and listen because she hadn't really said very much. And then people were like, oh, okay, what she said. Yeah. So, so honestly, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not a, not a, a qualitative expert, but um, I kind of felt like, uh, I, I liked the twos, they were okay. The ones, we kind of just went deep. But yeah, to answer your question, um, there were times maybe when, I, if I look back from the first notes that I took on the first transcription of the first person and the, you know, the last group, um, they, they, weren't, they weren't too different. I might have heard a theme somewhere that I thought, ooh, let's investigate that more on the next one, but I didn't want to I didn't want to deviate too far. Plus, I just knew how long it was going to take to get through the questions. Your twos and threes, were they from the same countries? Or were they um, or oh, the, well, in that instance, the two people that were having a disagreement, kind of. Um, they were both European, but no, they weren't from the same country. Yeah. But. Lots of people thought um, everybody's really nice, everybody's really accommodating, everybody's really helpful. Those were... Um, um, yes and no, um, but then there were, um, I would say yes, there were some, uh, some of the Serbians were just like, quit asking me if I need help. I don't need help. If I need help, I'll let you know, you know. There, there were some kind of cultural things there where some were more, I don't want to say were more needy, but some people were like, stop, you know, I'm, I'm independent, I don't, I don't need this. And other people were like, oh, they're so nice, I really appreciate that help. So, you know, so I think that, that some of that could be investigated by, by country as well, maybe. I don't know. Pages and pages and pages of things to look through and highlight and code. Other questions? Comments? What's missing? If you were going to continue this, what would you do? <coughs> yes? The first thing I would do is I would put British Columbia back into Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do have some other. I do have some other Canadians up uh, in there, uh, but I haven't. Uh, I haven't typed it up yet. Just, yeah, just yeah. Take it yeah. No, no. Some of the other. Some of the other. Well, even like the New Zealand athletes, they were just like, well, in Canada, but they don't count. Or you know, Australia. It's like, oh, you all don't count. You all speak English. No, not really. Anyway. 
Yes. I'm, I mean, this would be a, another round of interviews, <coughs> but I would be curious how much they've internalized the student athlete rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And this, because I mean, this, this, this sounds like very much what mm -hmm. the NCAA wants international student athletes to say. Mm -hmm. about, you know, the opportunity and mm -hmm. how everyone is, and the athletics, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I, I would just be curious. Yeah, I don't know. They, I how, how that attitude has changed. Yeah. And like they said, when they when they got here and mm -hmm. their educational experiences, especially right. prior to coming here, um, that that that's why I asked the other question. Um, yeah. About the age. Right. I, say, I wondered how much. How far along they were in their yeah. The exposure time had been. Yep. Yeah. Well. Um, I think, you know, some of them even up into the competition of their first um, national championship or whatever the championship was that they got to, some of them even then didn't understand how, what they needed, like they still hadn't wrapped their brain around divisions and conferences and whatever. And so I don't know if they've, uh, if many of them understand the message of the NCA at those younger years, but maybe they hear it more or just hear it collectively. This is what you know, intercollegiate sport is meant to do, but. Had any of them transferred or were they all of their? Original? No, they all were um, original. They're, yeah. Which I thought was interesting as well. Yeah. Did you ever get the impression when they start talking about being satisfied and all that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that they might be trying to tell you uh, what they thought you wanted to hear? <laughs> um, no, not really. Um, I, I, I didn't bring up the, the financial aid piece, um, but these women are all on scholarships. These, these women are like, what? How much money do we? Okay, I knew we were getting our room paid for. I knew that we might get some food, but I had no clue there was a stipend coming in the mail. I mean, they are in awe of the resources that are directed at them. I like they, they they if they get a fifteen hundred dollar check they're just like what and so they depending on their sport a lot of them that they save that money they're very frugal many of them it sounds like and they might use that to bring their parents over um, they might use that for their summer tours or their whatever fees that they have to pay to whatever they're participating in in the off season they'll save the money and you know go home themselves for a holiday or whatever. Um, so there were a few comments like, I don't know what these American kids are doing with their money, but dang, this is a good gig. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's a fair question, whether they, whether they, felt, like, um, whether they felt like they were telling me what I want. But I, I got the impression they were pr being pretty honest. Yeah. yeah. Just from your other research, this isn't really related to your interviews, but <coughs> I'd be curious about the retention rate of when they first come over compared to like, an average American freshman student? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, I mean, those numbers are available in most athletic departments. I think it's, um, particularly on the women's side, it's really high because a lot of them take classes during the summer. And, uh, well, you can see it with the football athletes, right? Okay, a lot of them get their degree in three years because they're training during the summer. And so I think the retention in general is probably pretty high. Um, and then they end up graduating early and getting a fifth year or you know trying to do something um, I think that's that's becoming more the norm probably or a second degree or you know whatever um, and yeah I think go ahead Sorry. no that's so good you mentioned your uh, colleague that you're working together mm -hmm. is he or she or both um, do you have multiple mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. Are they, do they have experience <coughs> with the uh, international <coughs> being um, I think so, yeah, yeah. Yes, to answer your question, if I think about it. Yeah. Yes, 504, we started four minutes late, and we're ending four minutes late, darn it. All right, all right, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>